Hey, welcome back to the show. Many thanks for staying with us. Mind you, we're also uh, uh, on Facebook Live. So if you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can just drop us a message so we know you're watching. We probably may acknowledge you along the line. Well, you may have heard this already, but let's just reiterate that throughout this week and the next, Joy News will be bringing our viewers stories from Germany as our journalists have been traveling across the country to investigate the refugee crisis there. But while on that assignment, Erastus Asari Donko and Kipi Kumsen took off to learn about the city of Cologne. Now, it's a city that was once bombed and flattened during the Second World War by the UK's Royal Air Force. But 70 years on, life has bounced back, leaving no trace of that former devastation. A beautiful river, the Rhine, an efficient rail transport, a modest skyline. There is life in this city founded in 38 BC. Germany is a beautiful place. In fact, we've been thrilled walking around the streets. This is Cologne. Behind me is Severstrasse. Beautiful place. But what makes this place so interesting, you could see a number of coffee shops, food joints, places where people could sit, generate ideas and all that. So the history behind this place is that a lot of artists, producers and writers have evolved ideas just by sitting here, taking a cup of coffee or while in our way time. Beautiful city, isn't it? But this is a city rebuilt after being flattened during the Second World War by the UK's Royal Air Force only 70 years ago. Close to 35,000 long-ton bombs were dropped on the city. Well, that belongs to history. With a human population of a million, Cologne attracts hundreds of thousands of tourists each year. Cologne Dome or the Cologne Cathedral, visible from every corner of the city. Well, Germans love their coffee. They love their ice cream, their Coke. And, oh, sorry, you hear the bells in the background? Yeah, it's because we are at the oldest place I found in Cologne, Germany. Uh, quite exciting to see it, actually, is the Cologne Cathedral. And I can tell you, this is about 700 years old. The Roman Catholic Church, actually, the second biggest church you can find in the world. And as you can see, I have my strawberry cake right here. Yummy indeed. And um, let me have a bite. Mmm. Nice. The cathedral is huge and has got such a detailed architecture. It is the pride of the people in Cologne. Around the cathedral are the street performers, like this man treating visitors to some great tunes from his flute. Less 
take you now to the Cologne Museum, holding thousands of relics from the Roman Empire. So the city of Cologne was actually founded by the Romans. And so you could see a lot of archaeological remains dating back centuries, thousands of years, stored in this museum for the purpose of posterity. Now, where I'm walking right now, a little bumpy for any chariot or means of transportation, though, but it's actually the last road remaining in Cologne constructed by the Romans. And the legend has it that indeed the Romans constructed thousands of kilometers of roads to advance their course in history. Cologne is also known for one thing, a special beer called the Kölsch. This enclave is where perhaps the best brands of Kölsch are served. One Kölsch. Wow, nice. In Germany, the best of beer, the court. And that's what I'm taking. They say when you go to Rome, do as the Romans do. But one piece of advice, if you come to Germany and they give you a menu, perhaps in a restaurant, and they say, have a ham or have a chicken. Don't be mistaken, it's not a piece of chicken, it's a piece of bread with cheese. Reporting for Joy News. Erastus, Asaridonko, Cologne, Germany. barely two weeks since the eight major economies of the world met in Germany to deliberate on issues of global concern, key among which is migration. We take this matter seriously because many of our young people are risking their lives to get on the other side where they consider the grass greener. Also, it's been a year since a major airport through which many Africans transit to Europe came under terrorist attacks. I'm referring to the Atatürk Airport in Istanbul, Turkey. Those are the two issues we'll discuss in this week's round of re European politics. Let's start with Germany. The Chancellor Angela Merkel made a case for more attention for Africa, but it's not as simple. After the big deliberations have been made, what has been the post-G20 migration discussion in Germany? Kate Brody is a political correspondent with our partner station, DWTV. She stands in for uh, our regular Thomas Paro today. Well, Kate, uh, good to have you. Last week when I spoke with Thomas, he took us through the Merkel plan for um, Africa. We know that it's not been easy because he did indicate that there has been criticisms for that plan. What has the post-G20 discussions on this matter in Germany been like? Well, obviously now one of the main points of discussion is to exactly what extent uh, the compact with Africa is going to be implement implemented um, in the coming months and years um, ahead. Obviously, the G20 presidency is held by Germany until the end of the year. Mm. But obviously next year that presidency then changes to Argentina. Whether or not this will still be so high up on the priorities there, in a country that is obviously has its own um, agenda and own priorities that aren't necessarily um, Africa and um, yeah. migration from Africa. That's something that we'll have to see um, what happens next year. Then it does appear that it n not much has changed uh, since we spoke to uh, uh, Thomas last week. But then America is one of the G20 countries that's deporting about 7,000 Ghanaians. This is just Ghanaians living there illegally. In Germany, has there been any plans or national discussion on deportations of migrants who do not meet the criteria for asylum or do not have the eligibility to, to stay? 
Well, the interior minister, the German interior minister, Thomas de Mazier, he's pledged uh, to increase the number of deportations from Germany this year. Uh, last year alone, we saw 25,000 um, unsuccessful asylum seekers mm -hmm. uh, deported from Germany. And that number is expected um, to stay around the same level this year, if not the same. Um, and most of those people that are, are affected by those deportations um, are those who um, don't actually come from what here is classed as, who, who actually do, sorry, come from a safe country of okay. origin. And that includes Senegal and, and Ghana. Um, and that term, safe country of origin, basically means that it's kind of any country in which Germany doesn't deem the citizens to face any kind of political persecution mm. or if they don't um, face any kind of degrading or inhuman treatment or punishment. Um, there were around um, just over 2,000 mm. um, people from Ghana came to try and apply for asylum in Germany last year, um, of which only um, reportedly around 10 uh, were accepted. So obviously, out um, of what those number? Uh, people who are applying are being deported uh, back to safe countries of origin mm. or those that are deemed safe by Germany. Mm. So if 10 people, for instance, were the only uh, eligible people to stay, out of what number did they take out that 10? That was around just over 2,000, um, wow. I believe it was around 2,500. Um, and so obviously um, that's very uh, on a very small scale compared to the numbers that we're seeing from other countries. Mm. Um, but another um, option that um, the German government is trying to encourage at the moment as well is voluntary return, mm. um, which means that depending on specific what country you're from, um, what your personal background is, lots of different personal elements um, you can actually return uh, to your home country um, for a kind of financial, and you'll be given some financial aid um, to help you do that. And so instead of just deporting unsuccessful asylum seekers, Germany is trying to also encourage people to return voluntarily right. uh, with financial aid, and there's been some uh, 40 million euros set aside for that. I see. That's interesting. Let's finally turn our attention to Turkey. Uh, now, you've also been monitoring events in that country. Uh, what can you tell us about developments there? It's been a year after, the f uh, after some 41 people were killed and over 200 injured in what was a major terrorist attack at that international airport. Well, of course, uh, the <laughs> after effects have been hugely dramatic. Um, just within the last few days, the state of emergency, which President Erdogan declared after that attempted coup, um, that has been renewed again for another three months. Um, and this has been a cause, cause for concern for um, many critics um, of what's going on in Turkey right now. Um, because, of course, this allows Erdogan, um, in theory, to push through um, some legislation without it having to necessarily pass through Parliament. Um, there's also an ongoing um, crackdown um, on many um, kind of academics, journalists, even health organizations. Um, some 169,000 people um, have been charged, um, have been um, charged of being in connection with a terrorist organization, oh. um, and 166 journalists are also still um, in uh, being detained in Turkey, um, a prominent journalist, of course, from uh, from here in Germany, Dennis Uchel, um, and also some uh, another uh, human rights activist, and um, they've also been uh, detained. Um, so this is uh, causing great concern, especially in terms of um, the EU um, accession talks for Turkey. These yeah. are slowly slipping out of view. Um, and even just earlier today, um, the foreign ministry, the German foreign ministry, has summoned the Turkish ambassador over these latest arrests um, right. of uh, human rights activists in Turkey. Um, so this is a, a year on. Uh, this is really affecting European uh, relations oh. with Turkey and especially um, between Germany and, and Ankara. And right. Of course, as well, we've also heard uh, renewed calls from uh, the Turkish president that he would be willing uh, to uh, reinstate capital punishment if parliament uh, were willing to pass through that bill. Okay. He has said on several occasions that he would sign that, of course, which would throw any kind of accession talks into the EU completely out of the window.
Mm. It will be very interesting to see how that pans out for Turkey since they consider this uh, session very seriously. Uh, Kate, thank you very much for joining us. Kate Brody is political correspondent for our partner station DWTV, bringing us up to speed on our weekly round, of course, of uh, European politics. Well, you're still watching the polls with me, Gitsi Andopia. We'll be right back.